Once again, God's blessed us with another beautiful Lord's Day to come back out here to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Thankful to see each and every one of you out here this morning. Appreciate the Bible study that we engaged in this morning. It was a very edifying discussion uh, that we were able to engage in this morning. Appreciate the prayers that have been led in our hearing and appreciate the opportunity to sing these beautiful songs uh, to praise to God uh, on this day as well. Appreciate you for coming out here this morning. Now, this, as we said this morning, this is our uh, last uh, message of the gospel meeting that we began on Thursday night. And I know I've been thanking you each and every uh, night, but I want to say that again, that I thank you for uh, inviting me at, at, into uh, this assembly with you over the last uh, few days to stand before you and talk about things that pertain to God's Word. Uh, I appreciate that. I came into this meeting with the intent of encouraging you, and I hope we have, but you have encouraged me so much. I, I word just can't describe the, the gratitude that I have uh, for your, your kind words, uh, your encouraging words, uh, the love that you have for God's Word, the work that you're doing in this area. Uh, it's, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I appreciate Brother Dan and thank Brother Dan for calling me up after talking to the brethren here uh, and, and asking me to come do this uh, gospel meeting. I've known Brother Dan now for some time, and it just seems like the more I'm around him, uh, just the closer and the closer we get, uh, the more he encourages me, the more uh, we learn from one another. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us that as iron sharpens iron, so a man does the countenance of his friend. And certainly I believe that Brother Dan is an individual that's done that for me, and I appreciate that, Brother Dan. Thank you for that. appreciate Brother Randall, uh, Bob, and, uh, DeWitt, and uh, Thetis and all the brethren here, Brother Don and all of you for uh, the encouragement that you give. I'm encouraged by, to see that my dad is coming here on a regular basis now. And, and I know that you're doing something good here because when I see my dad and interact with him, he seems to be so encouraged and, and eager to come here and has nothing but kind words to say about this congregation and, and uh, the, the preaching that goes on here. And I appreciate that. And I'm thankful that my wife Angie's accompanied me each of these days, and I'm thankful that, that I have her by my side, uh, as I've had her by my side for the past 20 years now, that she's put up with me for 20 years. And, uh, you know, behind every gospel preacher, if, if you're behind every good gospel preacher, uh, is a great woman. And uh, she is somebody that I'm able to uh, bounce ideas off of, uh, to get constructive criticism from, uh, to help sharpen up the lessons that I have. And so, although I may be the one up here that you're hearing, she works behind the scenes to help me. And, and I wouldn't be the person that I am today if it wasn't for such a strong, loving wife that I have in Angie. So I appreciate her, too. appreciate you for that. appreciate you for coming out here this morning, though, because ultimately, even though I am very thankful to all of you, most importantly, we need to be thankful to God. And we want to ensure that as we conclude this gospel meeting, we have and will... Uh, give God all the glory. We wouldn't be able to do any things that we do. I wouldn't be able to stand up here. I wouldn't be able to, to have such a, a loving wife. I wouldn't be able to have individuals like yourselves that are interested in God, were it not for God in our lives. And so we want to make sure that God is given all the glory uh, from this meeting and for uh, from every point forward in our lives. And so this morning I hope that we look at a lesson that will help us to do just that. I want to get our minds on the lesson by looking at a passage of scripture in the book of Psalms. Now, we're not going to talk about this lesson, uh, these scriptures specifically today, but this will help us to get our minds on the topic that I do want to talk about this morning. In Psalm chapter 118 and verse 19 through 24, the Bible says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. There's a lot that's said here in these particular scriptures. When we look at this particular, uh, these particular passages from, a, from a, a high up point of view, we see that the psalmist writer is, is praising God. And he's bringing to our attention all the righteousness of God and how that he wants to go in and, and, and be a part of that righteousness as well. When he says, open to me the gates of righteousness and I will go through them. And he talks about the gate of the Lord in verse 20. And of course, in verse 22, 
he quotes, uh, he, he, he mentions the passage that is quoted in the New Testament by the Apostle Peter over the book of Acts when he says, this is the stone which was rejected, which has now become the head of the corner, the stone that was rejected, uh, 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 the chief cornerstone rather that he says here. And he says that these things he's talking about, all the things he's talked about that, that, that is righteous about God, that is uh, wonderful about God, and, and all the things that he wants to embrace, he says it's marvelous. He says it's the Lord's doing. And then he says in verse 24, this is the, is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Of course, any day that God makes, we should rejoice in it. Regardless of, of, of how the weather is, regardless of, of what we have to do that day, the fact that God has blessed us with another day is a day that we should rejoice and be thankful for it because it's another day for each of us to be like the psalmist writer here and extol him for his righteousness, for the blessings that he bestows upon us, for all the things that God does for us. But what I want to focus on in our lesson today is the lesson that, that stems from this phrase in verse 24 when he said, this is the day. You see, there's days uh, in our lives that perhaps stand out to us more so than other days. There's days in history that we look at that stand out to us. It was said, uh, I believe it was by Roosevelt, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, he said that it was a day that would live in infamy. So it was a day that when you talk about Pearl Harbor, that immediately is evoked in your mind, the idea of that bombing. When you think about the bombs that were dropped on uh, the two cities in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was a day that is etched in history that we're not going to forget. Maybe a little bit more personal, maybe your birthday is a day that is important to you. We look forward to that day every year, and especially when we're, when we're young children, we look forward to it eagerly because usually we get showered with gifts and so on, and so it's a day that's important to us. Maybe it's your wedding day. We think about the day we were married or the day we graduated from high school or the day we graduated from college, the day we got our first job or the day we get promoted at, at, our, at, our, at our job or the day we finally get hired on at that one job that we've been striving to have and, and, been, and been dreaming about our entire life. There are certain days that are special to us and hold certain meaning, in other words. There's some days that maybe we haven't gotten to yet that we are looking forward to. Maybe the day that our children become Christians, if they're not a Christian. The day that uh, our children go off and they find a mate. The day they graduate from high school. Us husbands are looking forward to that day when we finally win an argument with our wives. That will be a great day. That might be one of those days that is an, an uh, impossible day. I don't know. But you get the point. There are days that are important to us. And in the scriptures, the Bible tells us uh, about various different points of, uh, of historical emphasis, uh, importance in regards to something eventful and impactful to us either happened on a particular day or will happen on a particular day. So today that's what we want to talk about as we finish up our gospel meeting. We want to talk about great days in the Bible. Now the first day that I want us to think about though is a day to help us really understand why it is important that we come together and talk about the things that we talk about from God's Word and, 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 and talk about the warnings that come from God's Word. Because the first day we want to talk about is the day the Bible talks about as the day of the Lord. Over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so here Peter talks about this eventful time where the world is going to be destroyed, it's going to be a time that comes upon us as a time that is without warning. When he talks about it's going to come like a thief in the night. Now a thief does not call you up and tell you in advance that he's planning to rob you. And he doesn't call you up and tell you in advance that he's planning to rob you at a certain period of time. We don't know. And so that's what he says here is going to happen in the day of the Lord. It's going to be a day that is going to come upon us swiftly, without warning. And the results of that day is going to be that the world is going to be destroyed. Nothing in this entire universe is going to survive this great day that the Bible is talking about here. It's going to come upon us suddenly, swiftly, without warning. And that should tell us something. 
Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Which, incidentally, Brother Dan alluded to Matthew chapter 24 this morning in our Bible study. And remember, Jesus talks about the travail that comes upon a woman who is, given, who is in labor when he talked about the various things that would happen at the destruction of Jerusalem. And here Paul uses it to invoke the idea that, that when the Lord comes back on the day of the Lord, when he comes back and the world is destroyed, it's going to be a day of pain and anguish for those that die outside the Lord. Because he says, Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, now as a result of, in other words, now Paul says here in these first five verses that this day of the Lord is a day that, as we said, is going to come upon us swiftly and suddenly. And he also said very plainly at the end of verse 3, they shall not escape. And so no matter where we are, I mean, you could dig to the deepest hole on the earth and go down all the way to the center of the planet. You could, you could go to wherever, the deepest, uh, darkest trench in the ocean. You could do whatever you think is going to protect you from being seen or, or anybody finding you, but God, God's going to find you. Amen. There's no escape. And so that should sober us up. That should get our, get our eyes open and get our ears open and get our, get our spiritual uh, thinking in, in place and get us to think about what is my status in the eyes of God. And so he says in verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Amen. It's a sobering thought to think about the day of the Lord. To think about what's going to happen when the Lord comes back. Sometimes I think we get the idea that there's going to be some sort of warning. You know, when there's a tornado coming and, and we read about on the news or hear in the, in, in the news cycles about a tornado somewhere and people's lives were saved because they had an early warning system. There, was a, there would be a siren or something like that and let them know that the tornado's on its way. The Bible tells us there's going to be a great sound and a great trumpet. But, it doesn't tell us that that is a sound to warn us and give us a little bit of time. It's to let us know it's now. It's here. Your fate is sealed. And so it's time to be prepared. And so then, the understanding that the day of the Lord is a day that is going to come, and it's going to be a day like no other day. It's going to be a great, powerful day. It behooves us to do whatever we can to think about God's Word and to prepare ourselves so that we are not sleeping on the job, if you will, but we're watching and we're, we're waiting, and we're preparing, and being ready, sober-minded about that particular day. Well, that's the day of the Lord. Now, there's a few other days we want to talk about, so let's move on. Let's think about the day that we're here for today. Today, being Sunday, is the first day of the week. And the Bible talks about the first day of the week, and the Bible tells us about some significant events that happened on the first day of the week. Of course, we understand, as we just remembered a few moments ago and talked a little bit about it in our Bible study this morning, one great event happened on the first day of the week that changed the history of mankind, if you will, or actually what I probably be more accurate to say was fulfilled the history of mankind and fulfilled the <coughs> prophecies that God gave throughout the ages of what was going to happen to bless mankind. And what we're talking about is, is when his son rose from the grave. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 16 and verse 1, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And so here we have these six verses here. The idea of, of, of Mary Magdalene and mother, the Mary, the, the mother, Mary, the mother of James, going to the tomb. And it tells us that the time that they went was 
the, very early in the morning on the first day of the week. Now, in the Old Testament, the last day of the week had significance, and that God rested on the seventh day when he created uh, the heavens and the earth. The Genesis, uh, the early chapters of Genesis tells us that, on, that after he created everything on day six, he was the last day he created things, and then on day seven, he rested. When he took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he taught them about remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy because it was, and it, the Sabbath was the seventh day. So they had some things that happened on that particular day that was important to them, and, and they're still important to us today so far as learning from the Old Testament and such. But here we find that our Lord and Savior, now that we're in this New Testament age, He rose on the first day of the week. And as such, there was a ripple effect, if you will, that has stayed with us even to this day in such that not only did he raise on the first day, and we don't just stop there and say, well, he rose on the first day and that's just it, but there's other aspects of what we believe, other aspects of our faith that are connected to this particular significant day. One of the things we did just a few minutes ago was partake of the Lord's Supper. In Acts 20 and verse 7, we, we read this verse this week where it says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow, or the next day, he spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. And so when we, when we wonder about uh, remembering the death of Jesus on the cross and his burial and how that he rose on the first day, we find, as Brother Dan mentioned in our Bible study this morning, in the book of Acts, an example of an act of worship where the brethren of the first century came together on the first day of the week to remember what Jesus did for us at the cross. And so this is significant for us. What that tells us then is, is on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or any other day of the week is not when we're to come together and partake of the Lord's Supper. It is upon the first day of the week. And the first day of the week is the day the Lord rose from the grave. The Bible also tells us that on the first day of the week is when we come together and give as we have been prospered, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper. That's what we did just a minute ago as the collection plate was passed around. It wasn't passed around because it was part of the Lord's Supper. It was passed around because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 that that is when, on the first day of the week, the brethren came together to, to lay by and store as God prospered them. It was a command from God. And so we come together on the first day of the week to give as we have been prospered. So Jesus rose from the grave. We partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We give as we have been prospered on the first day of the week. But something else eventful happened on the first day of the week as well. And that is... The church was established on the first day. The Bible tells us in Acts 2 and verse 1 that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the day of Pentecost, uh, that idea of Pentecost means 50. And if you count from the time Jesus rose from the grave, the number of days up to this particular day, Acts 2 and 1 is talking about, it's going to be 50 days, and you're going to find that it falls on the first day of the week. And so here they were on the first day of the week, the apostles, when he says they were all with one accord, he's talking about the twelve apostles. And here they are uh, at, the, at the beginning of this chapter in one place. And if we read the rest of the chapter, we find that after the events that occurred uh, are, have culminated, we find in verse 47, the first reference to the Lord's church being in its present form, being in existence. Now Matthew 16, 18, Jesus prophesied, I will build my church. But now we have on this particular day in Acts 2 47, those that have listened to those apostles it says these people praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so then the point is, is on that particular day, the Lord's church was established. And if you're part of or know someone who says they're a member of a church that traces its origins back to the 1900s or to the 1800s or to, or to the 600s A.D. and not to this particular day, then that's the wrong church. Now, we talked about earlier on this week, that's a counterfeit. And so the Lord's church began on the first day of the week. Well... So something is special about the day of Pentecost, obviously, since the church was established that day. But just as that verse said, the day of Pentecost, then that brings us to our third day we want to talk about. Let's talk about that particular day. So we've talked about the day of the Lord. We've talked about the first day of the week. Let's think about the day of Pentecost. Now what is special about the day of Pentecost other than uh, the great 
a wonderful thing that happened that the church was established. Again, verse 1 says, On the day of Pentecost, or rather when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. So what happened on this particular day? A lot of things happened between verse 1 and verse 47. 